So I'd like to welcome Henry, Henry, and Jonathan to this interview about Peter Pan Goes Wrong at the Amundsen Theater. And before we get started talking about the specifics of the show and how it came to be, I want to ask you about something that James M. Barry is quoted as having said, which is, we are all of us failures, at least the best of us are. Now, it strikes me in having seen the BBC version of Peter Pan Goes Wrong that Mischief Theater celebrates failure in its shows. So I'm wondering how failure inspires each one of you. See, I'd never heard that quote. I wish I wish I had, because that's a really Good one. great quote. We could, have, we could have been using that for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose, like, well, yeah, a huge part of our work is all about highlighting mistakes and celebrating them, celebrating the funniness of them and the vulnerabilities of these characters that we've made. So, yeah, I think failure failure is an intrinsic part of Mischief's work. But I think the nice thing about this show in Peter Pan is it's about this group of kind of this ragtag team trying to put on Peter Pan goes wrong and everything you know, and anything that could happen goes wrong as they put on their production of Peter Pan. But at the end, actually, there's a bit of a victory. You you kind of see that the characters manage to support each other and, and kind of get through it all. Oh, a lot of music is coming through my tannoy in the dressing room, so I'm going to turn that off. You ain't going to turn it off. <laughs> there is no way of turning it off. It's just a speaker. There, there is a, there's a dial. There's a dial you can turn on the wall. Yeah. See, this is absolutely perfect for this interview. For yes, this perfect. To so, John, you need that. You need that, John. There it is. There you go. There we go. There we go. What a weird piece of music. <laughs> Very brief. <laughs> so, yes, Very brief. continuing to talk about how failure has influenced us. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I cool. agree with what John said there. We, I, I think maybe I don't know the context of what Jay and Barry was saying, but. Uh, Failure is an intrinsic part of the creative process. I think you have to be ready to fail. You have to be willing to fail and willing to embrace failure at every step of the process in order to improve. That's the only way anything succeeds. No one gets it right the first time. And we've failed. We've probably failed as much as we've succeeded over the course of our careers. Uh, but that's every success has hopefully been improved by the previous failure. Well, you, yeah, I mean, you learn so much more from failing, don't you, than from... Uh... From getting it right if you get it right you don't often it's weird i mean if, if you if you sort of have a a success with something or something goes well you don't you actually don't learn necessarily learn a great deal for, no you know, exactly all you learn anything. is how to you, you you did that we kind of kind of happened with us when we did the play that goes wrong was the first big success we had but then all we really learned from that process is how to do one thing really well and it took trying other stuff and failing at other things to learn you know what works and what really doesn't work to improve mm. to the point where we are now. Well, I think as well. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, as we get, not that we're particularly old at the moment, but as you, as you, as you rack up years in your life, I think you get, I think you, the whole idea of like the best of us are committed to failure. I think, you know, it becomes easier maybe to coast and to not put yourself out of your comfort zone. And I think a big part of mischief, not just the goes wrong world, but the way we work as a company is about, staying uncomfortable and, and you know and trying new stuff and i think that's that's you know you have and if you're doing that you will fail sometimes but as, as henry and henry said that's a real positive well now correct me if i'm wrong but the play that goes wrong was born out of the murder before christmas um no. right well it really kind of kind of. <laughs> kind of but it was but you know one led to, parts of one led to the creation of of the others was my understanding and then peter pan didn't follow that long after afterwards so i'm wondering how did the process of developing one show influence the others and since you've been performing them for so long what have you learned in doing each of these different shows that maybe informs or improves what you do as the show continues to be performed uh well so uh, so the murder before christmas was that is the same show that play that goes wrong wrong was originally that was the title of the show that we first did in 2012 at the Old Red Lion Theatre in London. Um, we had to change, and that was the title of the play within the play, right? So that was the play that the Cornley Drama Society, the Fictional Drama Society were putting on. We changed it because we sort of ended up with lots of people coming to see it, thinking it was a genuine murder mystery. Um, and so we had to make that distinction uh, so that people knew they were coming to see a comedy about a group of amateur actors. Um, so that's where, the, that's where the shift came from. But that first version 
it was a 60 minute version so a shorter version of of the show uh but it, yeah that was the beginning of of the show and the beginning of the characters the cornley drama society and those characters then went on to do uh peter pan so it's the same it's the same the same actors playing different roles of course um so that i suppose was the big that was the big inspiration i think we thought that it was so much fun working with these characters uh and it was fun putting them in a murder mystery we thought well why don't we put them in a known title show have some fun with that and that was uh we, we wanted something ambitious for those characters to take on and that's where peter pan came from but has you know you've been doing this you know if you go back to 2012 and we're talking about about 11 years at this point are there things that you've learned along the way with various productions of any one of these shows that has informed changes or improvements that you've made in the others yeah of course hard to specify like like exact learning points but but i think um the, the main learning i think has always been that if you're going to do particularly with the goes wrong shows if you're going to do a show that's kind of related to another show you want to make sure that you push the envelope a little further so we've always tried to make sure each show is bigger more physically spectacular and then I think that a, a big learning is just like always stay like I, I suppose it's whenever whenever you try and second guess yourself I have found when you try and change the work not necessarily because you think oh that's the right thing to do but just just because of circumstance I think always I've found to go you know the big learning is always to go back to the truth of the characters that we've created and back to the truth of of the work that we're doing and kind of back to the fundamentals of of what mischief kind of stand for I'd say I'd say they're big learnings I'd say you know I'm trying to think we, we did this show on TV for example we did a, a BBC version of Peter Pan Goes Wrong and I think initially you think oh we've got to change it all and you know it's all going to be rethought because this is on TV and Actually, the answer was this is very, very similar to when we did the show at a fringe theatre because you can go back to that relationship where the audience can see the whites in your eyes and you can, you know, and you just want to be true to those characters. Well, you, I'm assuming that there are some modifications you have to make when these plays cross the pond because references that that may, you know, get resonate with a British audience are going to be different than references that are going to resonate with an American audiences. And, and numerous plays have made changes when they've come to New York or elsewhere in this country. Have you had to modify or have you wanted to modify anything in this play so that it lands more distinctly American? There have been a couple of things that we've had to remove. Not very many. Uh, generally, the small the plays thing, are, no. yeah, they're small things. The, the play is pretty universal. Um, and that's a, a big uh, selling point of it is that it's so accessible by people from different backgrounds. Uh, but the one of the major things we've changed is uh, the pantomime section. There was a whole uh, routine that was based on British pantomime theatre, which just does not exist anywhere else in the world. And if you describe it to people, it sounds awful and insane, which it kind of is. Uh, so there was a whole routine sort of subverting that that we did when the show was on in the UK, uh, with back and forth with the audience. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it isn't. Uh, he's behind you. All of this stuff, which makes sense if you're British and make, means nothing to you if you're American. So we cut a lot of that, but we've retained as much it of it. Doesn't as make, it doesn't even make sense to people in Britain. It just kind of is. It's just been done. No one can so tell you why. Yeah, no one can tell yeah. you why. <laughs> yeah. that, you know, to, to describe it very briefly, a man comes on looking <laughs> for someone who is behind him and. <laughs> says to the audience where is that person despite clearly being able to see them and the audience shouts he's behind he's you behind and you the, the person refuses to be able to see them and keeps yeah. looking and not seeing them and the audience keeps shouting he's behind you until they give up <laughs> and he's sometimes just sometimes an actor will say something that demonstrably is <laughs> like you know that i'm wearing a hat and the audience will disagree and be like oh no you're not yeah, and, the, and then it will then go back and another. forth. Oh yes, I am. Oh no, you're not. It's very much see like a your face. You look like who are these guys? They're insane. It's horrific. That, it's horrific. That's why we cut that bit. Yeah, <laughs> describing it now, it reminds me. It, it feels like something that's like an expansion of if you're talking to a toddler at playtime. The way that interaction goes expanded to a thousand seat West End venue. That's what pantomime is. And uh, I don't encourage anyone to 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 get involved in it. It's a strange, bizarre quirk. I don't like pantos, but there we are. 
I do. I can tell from your face, John, you're appalled by that, but I don't like it. No, I love a panto. Great panto is is, is great entertainment for the family. John. Yeah, but didn't 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 Monty Python take the whole premise of panto for the Department of of Argument Department skit, where somebody comes in and goes, "I made up an <laughs> argument." No, you didn't. I yes, mean, so, you know, that there's there's a parallel there. There's a definite parallel there. That the, theirs is better, I would say. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, to get back to the original point, we cut most of that, but we do a section. We What we try to do is teach the audience from the very beginning how to respond. Uh, they We teach them that they're allowed to boo Captain Hook, for example, which is a thing that, again, from pantomime, you very much encourage to boo the villains. Uh, whereas in traditional theatre, obviously, you're encouraged to sit quietly and watch. Uh, so you have to teach people it's OK in this theatre to shout things out and boo and, and give me a hard time. And then later on in the show, we have a lot of back and forth and I interact with the audience uh, and I let them attack me and I I try try my best to to attack them in return. And it's fun. Well, and if it were deadly silent, you would have a you would have a flop on your hands. You don't exactly. want, you don't want a deadly silent audience under any circumstances for a comedy. No. And my experience so far has been that Americans, as soon as they're given license to shout out, as soon as they understand that that is allowed in this theater, they go insane and are very happy to shout out and get involved and really by the end need to need to be told to quieten down because they've gotten too rowdy well based on my recent trip to new york where somebody cheered and said right on when sweeney todd slit judge turpin's throat i'm assuming <laughs> that audiences are feeling a lot more freedom to wow, yeah, express yeah. their enthusiasm wow I, right was on. <laughs> I was appalled at that moment because you completely miss the tragedy if you're all if you're all out for the re revenge in that story. Yeah, exactly. I, that I, is I apologize. I was just really happy that he'd done it. You know, that's why he'd <laughs> gone back to Fleet Street. So I couldn't I couldn't control myself. Can't say you. <laughs> I had a feeling you were in the audience, but I couldn't prove it. Um, there is a tradition of of on stage mayhem that's sort of backstage mayhem. Obviously, Noises Off by Michael Frayn is, is a good example. One Man, Two Governors is not backstage stuff, but it certainly takes the physical comedy, you know, into an extreme level. Um, I have to assume that no matter how many times you've done this show, it is a bitch to do every night, that there is so much that you have to put yourselves through. What are the physical challenges of getting this comedy right every night? Definitely a very physical show. There's no question. Um, and so I think, you know, in that sense, uh, you know, you get you do get a bit um battered, I suppose, uh, <laughs> as you kind of do it. Um certainly for, for me of all the mischief shows, the, the my my track in this is certainly the most uh the most physical. And there's um yeah, I mean you get a bit of, you know, it, it, there's just lots of running around, lots of falling over, getting up. So yeah, you're kind of physically tired. Um, but you know, the audience tends to carry you through. I think that's the main thing. You know, the audience is really enjoying it and um laughing and uh and so that kind of gives you a bit of adrenaline and and, and you kind of uh you know, you 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 mosey on through the show. Uh, that's, uh, that's kind of <laughs> I kind of look at it, I suppose, yeah. But it is no, it is physically tiring. I mean, at the end of the New York run, definitely I need I was in need of a need of a rest for sure. Yeah. What's all... the, what... Sorry, go ahead, please. So we're we're all pretty heavily padded now where we wouldn't necessarily have been when we started doing the show 10 years ago. Now everyone's got knee pads and shoulder pads and straps and ankle straps and things to keep us together because we're in our 30s and uh, it's not as easy as it used to be. Please, I'm in my 60s. I can tell you <laughs> it's going to get a lot tougher. Yeah. But you're not being thrown at walls as a career. Every night. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't get thrown at walls. I do spend a lot of time on my feet, though, so... Uh, you know, that still has a physicality. But even all the padding that you're talking about, there's a physical wear and tear that comes with that, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, weirdly, so I've not got any padding on for this run because my costume is is either shorts and a, a very short shorts and a very skimpy T-shirt or essentially a kind of loose cotton bag. So there's nowhere for me to have any 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 padding. But I think like Henry said, like, you, you tend to feel it more after the show. Like when you're doing the show, you get so much, like last night we had like 1900 people in. It was totally raucous. And you, you're not really aware that you're banging yourself. One of the actors, Chris, who has this a big aerial sequence, he cut his elbow quite badly last night. 
And then I came off and I was like, oh, Chris, you're bleeding. Are you OK? And he was like, oh, I didn't notice. And I think you, you that tends to be the way. Like I was with Nancy the other day on the beach and she had this big bruise on her leg. And I was like, oh, gosh, that's a bad one. And she was like, oh, I have no idea how I did it. And it tends to be that while you're doing the show, you're just having a good time. The audience is carrying you through. You're moseying along, as Henry Lewis said. <laughs> and then it's more in two days you realize, oh, that's that, that's damaged that. How have I done that? Um, yeah. So. Yeah, it's I think okay. that's, true. that's true with the with the sort of <clears throat> with the smaller injuries, caps and bruises and all that kind of thing. But also obviously you've got to be like there are kind of big physical slapstick things that are potentially dangerous if you know, if if not uh, not done with kind of precision, if people aren't standing in the right place or whatever, when the big thing falls over or whatever it is. So I think um yeah, definitely it's also important to make sure that the uh, everything is really precisely put together, everyone knows exactly where they are, everything's set. So that you can do the show, you can do the show with understudies on, and it's always safe. You know, everyone knows where everything is. That's important too. And if we look closely at the program, that we might see a credit for physical therapy and massage. Yep. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Regular. Um, this is I saw, I saw the BBC uh, special version of this, and I thought it was thoroughly enjoyable. But it got me wondering: How do you keep the comedy fresh for you guys? not just for the audience, but how do you keep it fresh for you as performers who go through it day in, day out? And as you know, in Los Angeles, you get eight show weeks with five show weekends. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's the standard schedule for us. We've always had, we've always done eight shows in five over the weekend. I think that the comedy is kept fresh, maybe in three different ways. The first is the audience and what you get back from the audience that keeps it alive. I think the fact that we all genuinely find each other funny. We we were doing a we were doing a dress rehearsal the other day, and I I laughed quite a lot during the dress rehearsal. And I think there was quite a lot of laugh, laughter in general. So there's there's a genuineness to it. You know, we're not just kind of oh my god, here we go again. Then out we go, and we kind of go through the motions. There is a genuine love for doing this show. I think you have to to have done these shows for as long as we have. And then I think the third thing that's been really fun on this US leg of the tour has been that we've had different actors come in to play narrator sometimes. So Harry, who originated mm -hmm. the role, Harry Kershaw, he's been playing it, he's brilliant. But then we've also got Bradley Whitford joining us. Um, and we were, were, in fact, as soon as this call's done, we're doing a pudding rehearsal for him. And his interpretation of that character is totally, well, he's kind of playing himself in our show. And that's a totally different interpretation. Very, very funny. And, and it means that lo tonight, loads of the moments will be totally new. And I think that's been a really fun experience because, you know, we've had Neil Patrick Harris, we've got Daniel Day Kim coming in, Ellie Kemper, and and that's always changed the timbre of the show and changed what those moments are. Totally. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think, I think, well, I think that's very true. I, th I think also because the audience is always slightly different, there's always different reactions to different things on different nights. Um, and because you're playing off of those reactions in these shows, right, the, the characters are aware of the audience um, uh, and they're listening to the audience. Um, there's there's that as a that as a sort of technical uh, comedy craft challenge means that it's always slightly different, right? Everyone's you know you're 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 constantly taking in info data from the audience, and and you're, that that is adjusting and affecting your performance and everyone's performance, and so you kind of collectively are working together in a kind of uh, uh, like a hive mind, I suppose, to. Uh, <laughs> that's not too grand to like to, to 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 do the show the best you can not just generally but for that audience specifically and i think that is a challenge that uh means that you can perform the same material uh and and, and keep it fun and interesting and and keep learning throughout the process how much corpsing is allowed or happens if, through a given run oh exactly. uh, weirdly it's different <laughs> Yeah, allow, allowed is annoyingly, it depends on who you're playing. It depends on the character, because there are a couple of characters in the show who their their shtick as a, as a character is that they are not taking it seriously and they're having a really good time and happy to just laugh. One character in particular, Max, is free to laugh whenever he wants. And so the actor, Matt, who plays him, does. And he will, if anything tickles him even slightly, he'll just openly laugh on stage, which is very difficult for everyone else. Because my character in particular is utterly august, what we call an august clown, which means I can never laugh. If I laugh, then the whole, my entire character is shattered because I can't be having a good time at any point. That character is just, he's having the worst night of his life. Uh, so I really am not allowed to corpse. How often it happens? I'd say it's pretty rare. But 
when you throw in a new element, like when, like as John says, we've got Bradley Whitford joining us. I think there's going to be there's probably going to be a fair bit of corpsing over the next week or so as we get used to his new way of doing things. Well, and I would assume you have to you have to find new things that he can do that are unique to who he is. You know, in watching you know David Suchet, the whole mustache thing was brilliant yeah. because of Hercule Poirot. Yeah, yeah. that's Bradley a has a. Yeah, Bradley has a totally new thing that he's brought to the table, which is, I won't spoil it for you, but it is fantastic. I saw him do it in rehearsals yesterday, and it's totally different to what David Suchet did, but very, very funny. Well, they're both different actors. I would expect it to be different, and I plan on being there on Friday night, so I'll get to find out soon enough. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the great things about this show and other shows that you've done is, is I don't feel like you have to worry about political correctness. This is a show where you can just have fun. But but as as artists who thrive on comedy and have made a career for yourselves with comedy, what is the is the state of humor in society today from your perspectives? I, gosh, that's a there's a curveball question. Um, it's an interesting one. I I th- personally I think maybe you've got to be a bit more specific between the difference of the of the subject and the of the joke and the target of the joke. But generally speaking, I think this whole kind of, I think too much is made of the idea of like, you can't do stuff and you, I I think you probably can. And I think that it's one of those things where it's said and then that idea garners and builds a lot of momentum. I think you've got to, you know, aim to be considerate and courteous. um, And yeah, and and you you want to be specific. If you're making a joke, you want to know what what exactly is, is being laughed at. But I, I think the state of comedy is quite good. There's quite a lot of good comedies being made at the moment. Like I've never seen more like stand up on that. It's, it's a, like, like lots of things at the moment. There's lots of very large contradictions being made about stuff. And I think the truth is that the answer is is more in the middle and, and it's not actually that dramatic. Like there's loads of really good comedy being made at the moment. I can, you know, there's, there's, there's so much stand up about, there's so much stuff. So it can't be that hard to, mm. to make comedy at the moment because, because there's more than there ever is. So you know, yeah. and the shifts in attitude, right? I, I, the shifts in attitude, and that's that's part of life, right? Like in in all in all parts of life, attitudes will shift, and society changes, and it's the same in comedy. If there's a shift in attitude, then the the, the comedy will shift a little bit. There's a comedian called Frank Skinner, um, in the UK, who's kind of very on the knuckle kind of style of comedy, um, and he, I've not actually read the full article, but he's at the Edinburgh Fringe at the moment, and I think he was asked a question about kind of you know you know how do you do your job at the moment and he said well you know my job has always been that I work with the line and I push where the line is and I operate right on that line and he said if the where the line is moves then I just move with the line so I think I think it's all good is my opinion are there Henry any thoughts I think in terms of the line I don't know I mean I I kind of think you know you should probably be able to tell jokes about whatever you want, but uh, people should also be able to say, oh, I don't like that. I don't find that funny. You know, I think both are fine. I you know, and I think if everyone keeps doing that, I don't think there's any great problems, really. Um, obviously, I think there's, you know, there's obviously jokes that are a bit insensitive and stuff. And, you know, but I, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's my opinion. But there always have been. Yeah, there always have been. And people, I think people people don't have the right not to be offended would be my response to most things. You're absolutely welcome to be offended by a joke. But it do, you, that doesn't mean you can remove that joke from existence. You can just be offended by it. And I think I'm a believer in people voting with their wallets. You know, if something is offensive or unpleasant, shouldn't be around, then people will stop going to see that. Uh, and I think that the the rule of punching up is still in place that as a comedian, you should always be punching up. And if anything, the change that's happened over the last couple of decades has been uh, the end of people punching down. For a long time, comedy was, it was allowed, you were allowed to punch down. People were making fun of of marginalized groups and making fun of minority groups and people who were the, in the lowest, weakest, most vulnerable people in society. That's the thing that's been removed, the thing you're not allowed to joke about anymore, or the people say you're not allowed to joke about anymore. And I think that's a good thing. There's no, there's no argument that that should continue, really. Right. And you're still very much allowed to make fun of the people in power, politicians and 
the the elites and the, the very wealthy and that's always punching up and that's still you know very much allowed and i would I, i'd hope that that will remain the case and god knows we have plenty of people to make fun of on both sides of the atlantic as it relates to politicians mm -hmm. we're also fortunate in that our brand of comedy is as i said universal we don't really enter into either side of the debate uh you know what what we do is people falling over which is uh, generally pretty politically clean. neutral <laughs> yeah politically neutral comedy of course i think that's been quite nice as well because i'd say that at the moment in a time when people are more divided and a time when we're all you know we've all gone through this we've all gone through the pandemic and lots of different things that make people feel unsettled and unstable and it is a concerning time i think there's something really profound about offering just total abject silliness to mm -hmm. all i think it's quite nice if you can be a unifier i think that's a great uh that's a great privilege right to 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 be doing something that can really bring people together so i'm i quite like i quite like that person there i quite like the the silliness of our work well i asked because i would love to see a nativity gone wrong um it exists you We've know that. i know you We've have that. i know you have that's what brought i that's what made me start thinking you know in this country anyway the idea that you would even remotely make any fun of such a sacred experience in the history of the world yeah. for those who are staunch believers is something that would well that's an interesting that's a really you, interesting you would one. have people you would have staunch <laughs> conservatives you know writing up on you so quickly i think that's a really good example of of the need to be specific about what the target is um so even though like biblical elements are in that show the thing that is being made fun of isn't the act of faith or the story of the nativity the thing that is the joke there is these actors who are trying to tell this story and that and i think as long as it's just it's just about clarity it's just about clarity mm. and yeah i suppose we're more of a secular bunch back home in the uk it's it's it but but um i don't know i would i would well it was I, interesting I, I mean when it when it went when it went out um there was a weird sort of there was a minor sort of storm with it i mean we had um what about that it was a very a very odd thing because the bbc ended up apologizing for it but i think that um it was uh they've since re-aired it so yeah yeah i mean I don't, well, <laughs> don't they feel that sorry about it <laughs> 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 they, 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 but they, basically what happened was that we had a, a weird situation where a quite it seemed like quite a small number of people objected to it very strongly as you were sort of saying i think sort of you know kind of like you know very kind of christian folks who just didn't feel that any you know that there should be no comedy present within the nativity story uh or it shouldn't be mocked in any way and again as john said we weren't mocking the nativity or jesus or anything like that we were just sort of you know it's all about corny but they, they there were a small number of social media posts about it that then got picked up by a newspaper who then kind of turned it into a, a story even though the sources were only you know three tweets or whatever um mm. and, and it then became a thing and then then that was kind of what i think the bbc responded to um, that's kind of what i mean about like the actual truth of the matter like in the middle it, like is is it's it's fine it's fine. Like if you read that, because I've totally forgot about that news headline. But if you read that headline, like yeah, there was someone who was a big group of people were tremendously offended. An apology had to be made. But but actually, I, I think everyone was just fine. I, I do think it, yeah. it was. You know, out of the couple of million people who watched it, there were a few who were offended, and that's always going to be the case. We, we, we've had it with every single show we've done. There's always been someone who's complained. But the I, I think all that's important is that you have to be able to defend it. And as John said, the target is very clear. We can totally defend that show and all of our shows and say, no, you've just misunderstood it. Um, and at the same time, if someone says, well, I'm offended anyway, you, you respond by saying, well, that's your right. You can be offended. We, that You have no right not to be offended. <laughs> you know, that's well, fine. Well, I would love to see that as an annual tradition here, to have that show on stage annually here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, well, I, you should have a look at, have you seen the episode of The Goes Wrong Show, the Nativity episode? I haven't, but I would love to see that expanded because if, if you know, if the, if the survivors of Monty Python can can plan on putting Life of Brian on stage as a musical, there's no yeah. reason this can't be put on stage too. Absolutely. I mean, L Life of Brian is much more actively critical of religion 
and you know yeah. a specific satire where literally as john said what we were doing was making fun of some actors putting on a play it could have been any play it doesn't matter <laughs> right right so jonathan if you thought the last question was a curveball i'm going to ask you about a comment that was made about about a video the three of you appeared on when you um were were with the tonight show with jimmy fallon and it was the worst i ever bombed and I don't know if you read the comments that came on afterwards, but I loved one in particular, as did a lot of people who saw the video. They said, <laughs> quote, I mean, say what you want about the play, but these three are the true bear twink geek solidarity that the Broadway community really needs in these dark times. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's which, who's what in that <laughs> breakdown? I, I, it's not up to me, you know. I, I, I think I can work out who who's who there. Um, I, I tend not to read uh, too much of the quotes because you can I don't, you can lose quite a lot of your life to reading comments about yourself. I think, but um, I'm, if, if that's what if that's the if that's the consensus, that I'm I'm delighted to to be that trio that the Broadway community. If, if sorry, that's what needed. was I? I missed the quote. Sorry, what was the quote? Say it again. The quote was, "I mean, say what you want about the play, but these three are the true bear twink." geek solidarity that the Broadway community really needs in these dark times. Bear twink geek. geek. Ken doesn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe I, it's... I'm the Billy, right? What, what, so what does that, <laughs> what does that mean, though? Well, I think what, they're, what I, I'm assuming it was posted by a gay man. Right. Um, right be, well, be, you're going to force okay. me... You're going to force me... Explain, please, in but detail. Craig. Right. <laughs> I can't respond unless I know what it means. I... You've opened Pandora's box. Now go ahead, Craig. Explain okay. exactly what these terms mean. <laughs> well, Henry, since you're on screen right now, I would assume that you were probably called um, the geek. I'm guessing. Can you tell by the giant gaming headset I'm wearing? Is that, you know, <laughs> just going going out on a limb there. <laughs> Yeah. And Jonathan Twink. Mm. Yeah. No, that's, so yeah. No, by no, process no. Of, of elimination, you know, that means that Henry, you would be the bear of the bunch. Well, yeah. <laughs> but they meant that as a compliment. The it, funny no, thing it, was is, is they were so enamored with the three of you that they just expressed that that adoration, I guess, in a unique way that that prompted other people to say that that was one of the funniest things they'd ever seen posted online, the comment that comment and that they were crying they were they thought it was so funny well that's nice yeah. no it's very sweet that's very nice that's a nice comment yeah the bear, all right the so and the geek that was so one last question one last yeah one last question for you guys um obviously you know that that in peter pan peter says to die will be an awfully big adventure um mm -hmm. british actor edmund Gwynn, best known as chris kringle in the original product in the original film of, of miracle on 34th street said on his deathbed deathbed dying is easy comedy is hard <laughs> how do you how do you reconcile these two statements and how does this apply to the work you do? Um I think it depends how good you are at comedy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that my experience of 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 kind of actors in comedy is I like comedy is quite a binary world, right? Like it is either people laugh and therefore it is it is a success, or they do not laugh and it is therefore a failure. And I think some people really don't like that um because that's they, they see that as quite harsh and I think if you really love comedy and it's kind of in your bones you quite like that you find it quite soothing because it because it kind of means that it, it helps you sculpt a show um and it helps you learn like we talked about at the beginning uh, and so yes yeah, so I so I, I I find I find comedy probably easier than the living bit so um you know <laughs> that, that's so I think it's fine there's a lot of there's a, yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion about like um comedy and drama and uh, a lot of comedy people are like well comedy's harder and uh, mm. <laughs> but i think um yeah i mean I, well I mean, yeah I, I, they both they both have their own challenges for sure I, I, you know um, yeah i think comedy i i wouldn't i don't know if comedy's harder than drama it's difficult to say i think probably the the reason that people say that is that comedy has the immediate feedback that drama doesn't and if you're doing comedy even if you're good at it, you have to be good at it 100% of the time. Every joke has to land because as soon as one joke doesn't land, you've died. You know, you're constantly 
skating on razor thin ice and one mistake and you have died and it feels absolutely awful to tell a joke and have no one laugh feels terrible and it doesn't matter if you told a thousand jokes before that point the one you'll remember is the one where you died and in that sense you know it's really hard because you can do a drama and if it doesn't quite work you didn't quite move people in the way that you intended to you'll never really know for sure <laughs> because there's no immediate feedback that's probably what makes the difference but you wouldn't have it any other way, would you? Well, no, because the positive feedback that when people laugh is instant gratification. That's what we're in it for. <laughs> well, thank you. I thank all three of you for your time. I'm looking forward to seeing seeing the show on Friday and enjoy your run in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thanks thank so much. Let me talk to you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.